Okay. Hang on to your hat. We are going to amplify our moments. And then we're going to correct the amplification because sometimes we get a little over-enthusiastic. You must be careful though because sometimes the correction gets a little over-enthusiastic. So when you find out the plastic moment that you're good for is 200, I'm afraid I may have to amplify it. Let's say your request is 200 because of legitimate things. But then when you try and correct it, you may find that it's corrected below the original number. That's not fair. What we've done so far didn't take into account, and we admitted it, the fact that all columns, when you get them, they've got a little bit of bend to them. We took that into account with the 0.866 times Timoshenko's uh, value for how much uh, buckling load you can put on something or how much load it'll take. But the problem is that little 0.866, what you didn't take care of, is when you put the load down the axis, you didn't add some moment in here, P little delta. Sometimes it's not so little. And so we need to discuss the fact that in the box, it's got a little delta to it, unless it's very rare. And when you put a little load on it, that delta gets bigger because you've got an added moment, P delta. Those are called secondary moments, but even though they're secondary, they can sometimes get quite large. This for all but the simplest of structures. Oh, there he's talking about analysis. Uh, almost always you're going to have a computerized analysis to get these bending moments and axial loads. And he's going to mention that all he's going to do is he's going to tell you he's assumed someone has done that and he's going to give you the results of that analysis. Now there's two problems. Number one I just mentioned is P little delta. That's if you're in a braced frame because you see the top and the bottom are not displaced with respect to each other. But in some of the frames where they're not braced internally or externally, they not only will have a little offset when they're in the box, when you put the load on them, they will sway to the side. Are there some real loads that push it to the side? And now we're not talking about P little delta. We're talking about the possibility of P times big delta. So one is without side sway permitted. You're used to that. And one is we'll analyze them if side sway is not restrained. It is permitted. If you got a computer program and you put the analysis in the program and they put the loads on this frame right here, I've shown them at the corners, but there's probably some uniform loads and things, maybe some more concentrated. If you put that in the computer and he comes back and first time through says the moment uh, is this at this joint because of the uniform load, it's this at this joint, the moment down in here, the moment down in here, and then he quits, then that's called a first order analysis. If on the other hand, when you put the load on there, he sees the load, let's say, is off center. And because the load is off center towards the right, this whole thing tends to sway to the right. Or he goes in looking and he finds this horizontal load that's been stuck on there due to wind, and it has moved to the right. He put all those loads on there and he got the moments at these points. But what he didn't take into account in a first-order analysis is the fact that after he got the answers, this point deflected. He says, yeah, I did. I told him about that. I said, I'm not asking, did you tell them that this load and the other loads caused that sway? Once you calculated that sway, did you change your answer because you now have a P big delta? He says, uh, no, I guess if they wanted to do that, what they would do is they would come back and they would bend the member themselves. They would tell me that the initial position of this thing was not zero 30 feet. 
they'd tell me it was zero, 30 feet plus uh, 0.6 inches. They could do it that way. I say, okay, thanks a lot. That's a second order analysis. Now, a lot of the computer programs today are set up to do that. Before they report to you, they find out that this load did indeed cause a deflection, and then they put the load on the deflected shape. First, they put it on the undeflected shape. Then they put it on the deflected shape, and they run it again. And then that load causing this P delta causes more moments in here, probably causes more deflection, and therefore he comes back and says, whoops, it moved again. And after three or four times, he says, okay, it's not moving enough to matter. I quit. And he reports the answers to you. That's a second order analysis. Second order analysis is pretty good because you don't have to do any of the stuff we do here. But if you're just doing regular old uh, designing of something and you have a first order analysis, then you need to correct your moments for these effects. Number one, P little delta. Number two, P big delta. There are three methods. People have been using them for years. And uh, finally, the uh, specifications had to sit down and say, okay, well, there's 19 of these things. Let's, let's get the three most common, see if we can't jam everything into one of two or three methods the way they do business, and then approve those. We say, these are good. You say, well, mine's not in there. So do your own thing. If you don't think it'll fall down and you're a registered professional engineer and you show me some theory, but we didn't much like your way of doing business, it's not one of the blessed three. Number one is called a direct analysis. Now, some of these will have some direct analysis in more than one, but basically this method is called a direct analysis. This is the only analysis where tau sub b is used, where the softening of the member is included. It is a second order analysis that considers both P delta and P delta effects. It is also it includes, if you only do a first order analysis, then give me those moments and I'll give you factors to correct them so you get an approximate second order analysis. They'll both be considered second order analysis. They're both legal. Nothing, anything ever fell down. Uh, was done by that method. In this direct method analysis, we use our tau sub b, just like you and I did previously. We use an effective length factor of 1, so that means we're not going to our g tables with this method. You say, well, you know, I don't know why we don't use g. I don't know why I don't get that gift. I don't know why I don't get to reduce my kl. They, the way it's, this is done, you do it with a K of 1. You are permitted to reduce the stiffnesses when you put them in and analyze them for moments. But uh, the K, one is you, K equals 1 is used both in the analysis and the strength. And more details, as you might imagine, by the ton. 16.1-23 is the spec. 16.1-520, look at that big number. Must be down in the commentary on this information. Tau sub b is only used here. These will become clearer once you see them. Right now, just a broad brush stroke. An effective length method. It's covered in Appendix 7. This one is covered in Appendix 8. Actually, this one kind of breaks down into two pieces. The first one here is little discussion on 7.1. Then in 7.2, they discuss the effective length method. Segui chapter 4, we did that. And secondly, this is in 7.3 of Appendix 7. It uh, also requires second order approximation of the uh, frame. You can compute the available strength as we discussed in chapter 4. And you use an effective length factor. And you do not reduce the member stiffnesses. So if you decide to use this method, and the exam says, did you account for tau sub b? You say, I use this method of analysis. It wasn't permitted. Third, it's what they call a first order. A first order would be just like we talked about with a computer with no correction for 
uh, the member being a little bit out of straight before you got there with your analysis. Simplified version of a direct analysis, so it's not a direct analysis. Can be used when certain conditions are satisfied. They tell you what those are in here. It's covered in 7.3. The member stiffness, again, are not reduced. So the only one you do reduce them is the direct analysis. These two you don't. That's some examples of all of them. Well, he got examples because he'll tell you uh, what method to use and how the moments that he gives you from a structural analysis you didn't have to run, how they were generated, and then you have to do your work in a similar manner. So here is the direct analysis, approximate second order analysis. If you have a real second order analysis from a computer, you, you're through. You just stick the numbers in and you go. But in general, we're talking about if you don't have anything but a first order analysis and you want to approximate a second order, then he tells you the limitations, tells you the calculation procedures. We'll talk more about that later. Basically, we're saying that your moment ultimate request is going to be some factor to correct for the out of straightness of the column or lateral loads causing it to not be straight multiplied times the M that you request non no translation. In other words, assuming the frame is braced. If the frame is unbraced, you have a second coefficient, which would be multiplied times the moment in the frame, the moments generated in the frame, if the frame does translate. As you might imagine a lot of our stuff is going to be without translation. If you know how to do this half in the real world, it's not that hard to pick up on that half. The ultimate request also has to be done the same way. It has P no translation. There is no factor with it. But because the thing, if you allow lateral translation, you see that big delta we talked about, then you need a correction factor for it. All the terms are defined. Then, if you actually have to have B1, Remember, there was a B1 times moment, no translation, and a B2 times moment with lateral translation. Then this is the amount that you have to amplify it. First off, that's what you and I derived. Anytime you see an alpha in the whole book or anywhere else, that's because we're trying to accommodate the allowed stress design people. So that for us is always a one. We insisted, if you're going to let them in, okay, but put any of the factors they need to come up to our standards, and cause it, call it something that I can ignore. It's always a one. Times the P ultimate, here's your generic term, P request, divided by P Euler 1. I've never found a P Euler 2, but I'm sure it's in there. I just haven't run across it. But it's P Euler 1. It is the Euler buckling strength of the column under discussion. And then that gets overly enthusiastic sometimes and causes your moment to be really bigger than it needs to be. And therefore, for that purpose, you have like a C sub B. You remember where C sub B corrected uh, the load down to, uh, in bending, down to something that was more like the truth. It was like a Christmas present. Well, the same thing here. This thing, this amplification factor may get kind of rowdy. And here you can tone it down. If you got this coming, you can correct that number. First place, if you're having an amplification factor and you go in here trying to help yourself, so remember that said B1M, M, so no translation? Somebody's making you multiply that times a number. If you're going to correct it, if you got that coming to you, well, that's fine. But you've got to be careful. You don't want to take a correction factor. This was derived, worst case. This 1 over 1 minus P ultimate divided by PE1. That's the worst thing could ever happen to you. And therefore, this is a cutting that down. If that number ever comes out, 
bigger than one, just ignore it. You say, thank you, I don't want that present. Because that's making the moment, when you multiply this times the moments, making it bigger. By the same token, if this number comes out 0.3, and you multiply that times a, uh, an increase due to the buckling about that axis, and the buckling about that axis is 1.1 uh, before you corrected it, well, 0.2 times 1.1 is going to be less than 1. So they say, look, this is a correction factor for your use, for your gift. It doesn't have to be bigger than 1. That makes no sense. It's no gift. By the same token, if you take our amplification factor and you drive it down below 1, then when you go get your moment, you'd say, hey, that's really wonderful. This much moment is really there, and I don't only need 8 tenths of it. That's not right. You can't amplify a 100% down into something smaller. So this must be stopped at the number 1. Where we're a 1 and they're a 1.6. Now, we'll get more into these C sub M correction factors because life is not as harsh as we thought. And you already know what an Euler load is, pi squared EI star divided by KL squared. The star is the flexural rigidity correction, uh, uh, for the thing. It'll have a tau on it if you're permitted to use tau. There's your tau, EI. It's used in the direct analysis method, and tau is defined. Here will be your amplification factor for P big delta effects, B2. And it's something just like we have on the previous one. Now then, nobody called my hand on it. I usually make sure I go fast enough you don't have time. Does that look familiar to you? Doesn't, does it? You're used to multiplying the tau times the EI to soften up the columns so they're not as fierce in trying to, to, to roll the joint as they could have been. But the point 0.8 you never saw before. And so you say, point 0.8? He says, yes. 0.8 factor accounts for the additional softening under combined axial and bending. You remember we got a tau for bending only. And if the fibers were bent badly enough and yielded badly enough, the joint itself became soft and less able to uh, rotate the joints. The, the, the girders and the beams coming in were still at 100% strength. But the columns themselves, their tendency to be able to make the joint roll was reduced. Now you know to not only have the bending, you also have some compressive load on it. So that makes the joint even softer, and that's what it's for. Counts for fact, factor counts for additional softening under combined axial and bending. So a very quick run through. Here is an approximate second order analysis. That was what you and I were calling case one. Won't go into it at all. Got a bunch of tables. Psi, C sub M. Got me. Uses these tables in that case. This is the only one that uses tau. Secondly, you had the elastic limit. I'm sorry, you had the uh, effective length. That was our case two. He describes it. He tells you what has to happen. Here are your required strengths. Here are your available strengths. Segui, of course, has summarized all this nicely in your book. Then third was a first-order analysis, which you then will have to correct because it's just a first-order analysis says required compression strengths, required strengths, available strengths. All of these have co commentary going with them. I 
Must be an effective length method there because I see him going for effective lengths. I see him still using these. So they're all here mostly to refer back to as we go on. Commentary on first order analysis method. We'll come back to that as uh, we see questions in what Timoshenko tells us. I'm sorry, Sugui tells us. So here's how I'm going to have to amplify my moments. Number one, I have a column which is very slightly out of shape. It has an eccentricity in the box. As you start putting load on it, because P got multiplied times the in the box out of straight, it has a moment at this point, and it has moments all the way up here at zero. Therefore, due to those moments, the thing starts kicking out to the side. As you get up to the full load P, it's kicked out I don't know how far, but possibly not a small amount. The equation in the box, you can take whatever you want. You can take a parabola, you can take a sine, you can't take a cosine. Uh, you can take a piece of a circle to get, and people have tried all kinds of things for grins, you get pretty much this. Obviously, if you say that deflection off of the straight line is a sine function. Those derive, uh, take derivatives nicely, you integrate them nicely, and all that kind of stuff. So there, we always just pick a sine. It's e times sine of pi x over l, x bending how far down the road you are, e being whatever. 305 says that if you take the second differential of a displacement on a beam, that has to be minus m over ei. The minus sign is in there just for signs use because we like to measure uh, when the beam is bent, it bends above the axis, and then here's the beam, and here's a positive y direction. It just keeps compression on top, tension on the bottom. It doesn't change anything. Uh, the moment in it I see is the load axial times y0 that came in the box plus y, the additional y, not necessarily the maximum, but this one that varies from 0 to something in the middle. That's how much moment is in there. Then I ought to be able to take second differential of that and set it equal to that. And y0, I'll have to put in this equation to do the job. We've done a thousand of these. Uh, substitute that into the differential equation. d squared y dx squared is uh, minus p over ei. I'll let you just look at that, check it out. Rearranging gives you this, uh, ordinary non-homogeneous differential equation. Plug in the boundary conditions. You find that some of the terms got to go away. You find some of the terms can be valid. Plug those boundary conditions in. And you get P Euler is equal to pi, excuse me, P Euler is one of the terms you get, pi squared EI divided by PL squared. I rearrange it, you get P Euler over P, where P Euler is the Euler buckling load. Plug that back into the equation for Y. Here's your equation for the moment. You know the moment on the ends is zero, stuff like that. Maximum moment occurs at L over 2, and you get the maximum moment turns out to be M0 times 1 over 1 minus the load on the column divided by how much Euler said it would take to buckle that column. Now, you want to see that. I'll be glad to do it. There's nothing to it. But your eyes already roll up now, much less if I start deriving something. So look through that. The point is, your maximum moment actually in that beam, because it had a little bit of out of, ramp, out of uh, straight to it, once you put the full load on it, it's not any longer M0. It's multiplied times 1 over 1 minus the request for load divided by Euler's load. That's an amplification factor. Look when you start requesting the Euler load. Euler load over Euler lo load is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 1 over 0, it's uh, infinitely increased. 
which for all intents and purposes, when it collapses, that's what it looks like. So this is your moment amplification factor if you put a load on a non-straight member. For us, he says, forget a loud stress people, the load P is your ultimate request and P sub Euler is the Euler buckling load. Now it's kind of interesting uh, if you have a frame and a wide flange in that frame looks like that. I'll be able to draw it in three dimensions if I can. Here's the column in your frame. If you load it from the side, as I would think you would probably want to do, I don't think you very likely want to load it from the side about its weak axis. You'll orient it such that it has the most strength for the money. Then you are interested in these terms. You're interested in how much load is requested. That would be P sub U regardless of what's going on, except this Euler load now. Since you're kicking this beam out about the strong axis, I need to know how far it went out due to the load on the beam, about the XX axis. So there's one of these that really goes with the X axis. There's one of them, if you have to do this and put the load about the weak axis, then you'd be using Euler's uh, opinion of life buckled about the weak axis. So here's an example. Does he want you to use that amplification factor? You don't get to correct it yet. You don't know how. To compute the amplification factor for the beam column of example 7-1. You'll find it on, in my notes, on page 302F. It was probably before that in the text. But I'll give you everything you need here. It was a 10 by 49 wide flange. Had I sub X of 272. I sub Y of 93. After I wrote it down, I realized it's not used. It was 17 feet long. It had a 10 plus a 17 service load. I don't remember what, but factored. It turned out to be 25.2. And the guy told me that he intended to orient this column in this direction. He's going to put the 25.2 and force it to bend about the strong axis. That makes sense. There's not much sense and if you got a 25.2 external load and you got a column there you might as well do your bending about the strong axis so first we go to p euler because we need all these terms here we need p euler we need our request we need the initial moment and so on we don't need the initial moment to get the amplification factor P Euler is pi squared EI about the x-axis divided by how long is it effectively about the x-axis squared. Why x? Because this out of straight in the box plus the more out of straight that you see here due to this is causing a P delta not about the weak axis. It's causing it about the strong axis because that's the way you put the load on it. So that is I sub X. I really should have written down I sub Y just so you would see it's not I sub Y. Its length is still 17 feet. Uh, and it's pin pin, so it's still K is a 1. And it's still steel, and pi is still pi. This is Euler's opinion about how much load it would take to buckle the beam about the strong axis. The fact that there's a lower load that would probably already buckle it about the weak axis isn't my problem. My problem is because the load came like this, it deflected it about the weak axis. A strong axis, thank you. So here's one drawn up. Here is somebody who knows his business, put the load about the strong axis, 
the axis of bending is xx due to the transverse load. P sub E would be P sub E about the strong axis. Here's somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. They say, that's not true at all. I mean, I got this frame all tied to other things like that. Uh, and that's, I put them the, welded to the other pieces so they will be bent about the strong axis in general use. But this particular column happens to be on the corner of a building, and it gets some wind load from the side. I don't, there's nothing I can do about it. I can turn it so that this doesn't buckle it about the strong axis, but when I do that, I lose all the strength I need in the frame to carry the loads. This one, the bending is about the YY. P sub boiler would be E sub Y as opposed to E sub X. Continuing, Here's where I recalculated. Here were the service loads, 1.2 dead, 1.6 live. Turned out to be 204. That's on page 303 in your text. And your moment had the numbers given. It had a 25.2 kip load in the middle of the beam, causing a moment request of PL over 4. That's the equation for the maximum moment in a... Simply supported beam with a single load at the midpoint, 107.1. Sadly, this 200.4 is going to have to be uh, amplified, or the, excuse me, the moment is going to have to be amplified. You don't have to mess with the load, but the load times E is going to cause some more of this kind of stuff called moments. Our amplification is 1 over 1 minus your request is 200 kips of load at an eccentricity, I don't know how much, but I've already handled that inside of the amplification factor, divided by P Euler, P Euler, we must have got 1,871. 1,871 kips of Euler strength about the x-axis. Therefore, we crank it out, you get a 12% increase. I see why that's there. The beam has got a little less centricity to it, and it gets worse when you put the axial load on it. And therefore, the moments are really a little bigger, 12% bigger than the numbers we had before. At 107.1 times 1.12, it's 120. If you don't know where the 107.1 comes from, this PL over 4, you can look on page 302G. It's got the tables for bending moments in beams, PL over 4. Now, brace frames are not too bad because they only deflect little delta. For example, here is a pin-pin beam, a little bit out of square with a load on it, kicked out a little more. That's a P delta moment that you hadn't counted on. You'll count on it by that correction factor. But when the thing is unbraced, like this one is, you don't have a little delta, you got a cap delta, because you loaded it from the side, and you had all these loads that had to be carried in compression down the columns. And therefore, your moment request when these things get big, not just the little bit that started out out of square, is uh, the same as before, B sub 1, M sub, no translation, plus... B2 with the lateral tra translation considered. We're going to get into a lot of those. This information is on 16.1-237. Tells you what everything is. And we'll do some. Now, back to members in braced frames. When you derive that amplification factor, you considered it was kicked out to the side, and nothing happened except everything got worse. And because you can have moments on the end, or you could have the lateral load we showed you earlier, things are getting really worse. That's about the worst case you're ever going to have. And I'll tell you where the maximum moment's going to occur in this case. It's going to occur, if that's M0 and that's in M0 due to symmetry, it's going to act in the middle. It's at the center. 
Here you see the moment. These are the end moments applied at the end. Here is your P delta effect. I know where the maximum moment occurs. And the equation that I derived is for that worst case. Oh, well, there are your, well, those are moment diagrams and deflection diagrams. Maybe we'll come back for them because I don't see the one for concentrated loads. Maybe, maybe they belong a little down the road. I won't throw them away. He says, in the case we just looked at, the moment is constant throughout the member and the maximum occurs at the center. However, if you have, well, if you have this case, that's a worst case because it was already deflected that way and the load caused, the load caused it to go out more that way. Here, the same thing. It was already bent a little bit. This caused it to bend some more, making the P little delta effect worse. Here you have two moments on the end. This came from beams up here and beams down here, wanting to roll, you not letting them because it was welded to the beams. And those moments are, for example, 600. And it was already kicked out to the right, and you just made it worse. You might say, well, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go check which way it's out of straight, and I'll put the out of straight out of the box this way. Then when we put the loads on it, it won't go out as bad, and I shouldn't be penalized as badly. And it's pretty hard to guarantee that. So that's a worst case. That's a worst case. That's a worst case. This is a not a worst case, because the moment on this end kicked it out maybe that far. And a third of the moment on this end kicked it out that much. See how this is six inches and this is only three inches? And here's another not worst case. Another not worst case is you still have the 600 and the 200, but one of them makes it kick out to the right. As a matter of fact, it by itself would make it kick out like that. And then when you put this moment on it, it was enough to drive it all the way back to the left. That's not a worst case. Even if it doesn't go to the left, even if it really goes like this, that's not a worst case. And so I understand your pain. You say, I need a correction factor for this. You're making me do this. I need a correction factor for this. In fact, I don't only want just a correction factor. I want a big correction factor. You got it. Your wish is our demand. These are the moments you're going to amplify, your CE305 moments, the moments that come out of a first-order analysis. For example, you have a moment on this end. looks like this, M2. You have a moment on the other end. Uh, on the other end going, in effect, the other way. See, this one's causing uh, compression in the left side. This one's causing compression in the right side. So here, for example, the moment, 600 and possibly 200 down in here. The bending of that would be uh, don't know where I'm getting these numbers. Okay, zero six. Okay, here are the moments due to the axial load. So you just take the axial load and you multiply it times this delta. This has no delta, so you have no moment. Right around here, because there's some delta, you get maybe a 160 moment. Uh, down in here, you get maybe 150. I'm just trying to say that looks like 160. That looks like 150. That looks like zero. That's zero. These are your moments due to the loading. These are your moments due to the P delta. Together, 600 plus 0 is 600. 400 and 160 is 560. 200 plus 150 is 350. 0 and 0 is 0. And something down on this end, maybe this is 200. Except maybe I gave you the wrong numbers here. Maybe due to the EI of this particular column, this is not 160, it's 
560 and something and something. Okay, sorry about that. 400 plus 560, blah, 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 blah. Here the moment diagram, you say, kind of looks like this. The biggest moment's still on the end. But if these numbers are twice as big as I did because I forgot to multiply times 2, then you may find the maximum moment out here somewhere, not at the ends. Oh, this is getting ugly in a hurry. Really getting ugly and howdy. <laughs> I want you to hurt yourself, but I do see you have your book open, so that'll uh, ameliorate the impact when you when you nod off there. See, what you're supposed to be doing is staying awake and make sure I don't go to sleep. I need a nap. So since you don't even know where the moment occurs in this situation, uh, you're going to get a correction. And it's going to be better than these corrections here, where they're both the same way. But whatever it is, you don't know where that's going to happen. Remember, this is your ultimate request. He says, no, it's not. This was my ultimate request right here. I said, well, what did you do? Did you brace the frame? Yeah. So that was the only moment. You're right. That was your original request. Unfortunately, due to your uh, uh, irresponsible application of a, of a load down the middle of the column, I'm going to have to amplify your moments. Did you have any lateral translation? He says, no. I say, no problem. That's a zero. But if you had some lateral translation in there from your first order analysis, I need to in, uh, amplify those moments too. Our B1 now turns out to be the amplification factor with the correction that you insisted on because every now and then your beam didn't deflect as horribly as it could. And this took into account the worst case. C sub M is always less than 1. Otherwise, it isn't a gift because you're multiplying your moment times this and that would make your request bigger. Or, and alpha is a 1 because alpha doesn't mean anything to us in this world, in the real world. And beta 1, if it's an amplification factor, I don't care what this guy does or how far down he makes you go, you don't go, go below 1 or you'll be taking the real required moment and knocking it down to less than 100% for no reason. You can't correct it out of existence. Euler is, as he said before, EI is the flexural rigidity with the star on it. You get to use the 0.8 times of E sub I, EI. The stiffness reduction factor, you'll find it on page 306F. You'll find it in your manual on page 321. You'll find this exact thing, this specification, on this page here. This stuff is on this page. This stuff's on this page. I try and annotate everything so you can quickly go to those pages. If you're told to go to those pages, those are good probably to have tabs on so you can get to them quickly on a quiz. Um, tau sub B is a stiffness reduction factor where if you're less than 50%, you remember you didn't have to do it, or you couldn't do it. It wasn't permitted to reduce the stiffness to your benefit. If it was bigger than that, what is he doing here? Fooey on this. I'm going to these tables. All I got to know is, you know, where to go on the table and pick a number out of a table. This gives the table values. But he must be assuming I've lost my calculator or something, or I've lost my mind, because I'm going to go get those out of the table. Now, this method uh, is acceptable to one of the three methods. Uh, includes a direct analysis. It requires the application of notional loads. In other words, one of the things that you have to do for the translation stuff is you have to account for out of plumbness of the columns. This isn't anything we've seen before. This is not the thing side swaying. This isn't its little bit of out of straightness as it comes in the box. This is when you built the dang thing, it looks like this. And you say, man, I did everything I could. We had levels and transits and everything else. 
I say, well, how did that happen? He says, I don't know. It didn't happen until we got up to there. And somebody tightened down that tie rod and the forces went down and did this. It's acceptable, but I need you to account for it. I mean, when you find it's bigger than a foot, well, you're going to have to go fix it. But if it's just within tolerances, it still needs to be corrected. And we do that by putting what they call notional loads on the floors, some percentage of the load on the floor itself. I didn't even know what the word notional meant. I never saw it before until I got into steel. The second method here we're going to discuss is the notional loads. These, these things go off on in, in interesting directions. Google, notional. What is notional? Uh, abstract, theoretical, speculative. In other words, it's not really there. But you take some percentage of the floor load and you put it on that floor to account for the fact that that load causes some bending around in your frame. And it accounts for the fact that it may not be perfectly plumb. Not real or actual, ideal or imaginary. All right. Effective length method, got the same kind of stuff, same kind of information, same times you can use it. Here's that note on the point eight, what it's for. It is a fortuitous co coincidence. I like that. Notional. Somewhere in here, somebody sent me to AISC... 360. The Dickens is AISC 360. Now, I don't see it offhand, but I was sent there because I didn't know what it was. So I stuck that in there. Mr. Risa, the structural analysis people, they knew what AISC 360. In Risa 3D, you can automatically apply your notional loads to the structure to comply with the code. Notional loads take into account a building's actual out of plumbness by adding a destabilizing lateral load. AISC 360 recommends either two-tenths of a percent or three-tenths. Oh, this is the guy that sent me to 360. I was still looking up notional loads, and I want to know what the structural people thought the name meant. Here's what a structural. If you don't know what RISA is, I'm sure you do. Somebody probably made you run it before. So then he came up with AISC 360. So I stick AISC 360 in Google. This is the new AISC specification, now available for free downloading. ANSI AISC, it's a combined spec, 360 specification for structural steel buildings. Specs, codes, and standards. So that's evidently, I don't know, it may be in ours already. i got to go take a look at it and see if it's just a piece of our code or if it's something that's a little different. All right, doing the next one would take more than one minute. See you next time. And he's out of here. Anybody get run over? Anybody killed? No? You're better. You're better. You're better. You don't listen to a word I say ever, do you? You could, you could care less. Sorry I asked. Does there need to be a... Is there always a... Or no, there does not. There, no, there does not. In other words, here is the structure. Uh -huh. Let's say you put the load off center. When right. you put the load off center, you cause more moment in this corner than you do in this corner because it's over that way. Those two moments are not the same, and the whole thing will flop over towards the load unless the load is symmetrically placed. So okay. it doesn't have to be a real load there, although many times it is. Okay. It's kind of assumed, I guess, if it's... Well, I wasn't talking about the column itself. That's okay. But what I was talking about is this frame right here. Uh -huh. If you put the load straight down the middle, the thing will deform like this. Yeah. Excuse me. Will deform like this. And if you put that same load over here. Because this is bent so much more, this joint didn't roll as much. Uh -huh. 
-huh. This kicks out further and causes a moment down here on this, which is not <laughs> equal to this one. Right. See, right now, kicking out, those were both the same due to symmetry. Right. Now then, this one's bigger, and the whole thing's going to flop over on its side kind of like that. It'll move delta. Yeah. It won't be near as much if you say, well, now I'm getting ready to, oh, okay, well, now you're going to call some real deltas. Okay. Delta is equal to this? No, this is the amplification necessary. CN? Uh, not actually. See, this one has no CN just yet, and the reason is you didn't know how to calculate it. Okay. CN will correct this problem. This, this is, you think it was a problem because somebody amplified your moment. And if you can cut that amplification down, Re, uh, uh, theoretically true, then that helps you in your design. And we're, amp we're amplifying every okay. moment in sight. Okay. If you requested it, we're amplifying it. <coughs> well, it, it, it does not. We don't know what that delta is. We're going to correct for the worst case that might happen to you. Okay. Yes, sir. I do. I don't, but I know it's listed on your syllabus in, three, in uh, 446. Yeah. Also on the syllabus, it has a thing there that says, what are your chances of making A, B, C if this is your first grade? First. Then once you're A and B grade, and now your chances are from past years, somebody made that grade, and then what was their chance of making an A? It was slightly reduced, still 10%. B, something. Go look at that. Do you think I should be fine? Now, I wouldn't say that because uh, you may get hit by a truck and, you know, only be able to see a little bit when you take the quiz. I don't know. But I think, I think all I can tell you is statistically, and it really is, gives you uh, statistics in the past, what the people made grades on quiz A and then quiz A and quiz B, what they made in the class. Okay. Uh, I thought you just get a Q-drop form, but if you go to lowry.tamlo.edu slash advising, just put in there Q-drop or drop, you know, and it'll control F for find, and it'll go down to Q-drop and it gives you calendars and gives you dates. Uh, no, 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 no. You can do it 20 minutes before it's due, but you got to write fast. Okay, sure. You too.